Daniel Barney. Thanks, Mr. Duterte and Sullivan. Um, I really appreciate everybody being here because it's hard. I know everybody has other things that everybody really needs to be doing. I, there's no doubt there's laundry and homework. And I love that the fact that there's students here, and I appreciate you guys being here. Um, so if anybody wants these slides, I'm going to look at Ananda and say that if anybody wants these slides, she's over here, uh, maybe we can have a sign-up email sheet maybe out there where we can email them to people, because I don't care who takes these slides, I don't care um, how you use them, although maybe I do care if you use them in some crazy way. Um, so, but there's also a YouTube video that is a little briefer that is similar to this, that covers about 80% of it. Um, I'm going to talk pretty fast. I am happy to answer questions. Uh, it's sometimes a little easier for me to capture all the questions at the end, but if there's something where you think, oh man, I have no idea what you're talking about, just stick your hand up. I can, I can keep with the flow. So we're going to talk about the physiology of addiction, how it is that this part of the brain breaks down. And I'm going to remind people that this is relatively new news. This, what you see on the screen is an article from Science Magazine in 1997. And so I'm not that old. In 1997, I was in medical school. And it was big news at the time that addiction was a brain disease. And the truth is that I would argue that most people in medicine know very little about addiction. Do I have clinicians in the room, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, physicians? I don't know how much you guys learned about addiction during medical school, residency, lots. I mean, if you're a psychiatrist or you're an addiction psychiatrist, maybe. But for most people, we learned almost nothing about this. And here's a disease that affects 10% of Americans. It's more than diabetes, right? I can tell you everything in the world about diabetes. I can tell you everything in the world about a bunch of diseases I've never seen as a doctor, because that's what you learn about in medical school. You learn about a lot of zebras. This is a very common illness that affects a lot of people, and most of us are not equipped to take care of it. Um, addiction affects the reward center of the brain, this very central, elemental part of the brain that has three components, the ventral tegmental area, the nucleus accumbens, and the prefrontal cortex. This is considered the most ancient part of the brain. Um, it is the part of the brain that tells you to get up every morning, find food, find clean water, and survive. Because the point of all of us being on this planet is to survive long enough that you can pass your genetic material forward. That is true for every mammal. Like, we may think we have another point on this planet, but we really don't, right? Your ancestors did a good job of survival. That's why you're here. There's a bunch of bodies not here because they weren't so good at this. So this is the most elemental part of the brain. I think of it as the lizard brain because every living being is working on this stuff. Can I survive long enough to spread my genetic material forward? Uh, we're going to spend no time talking about serotonin, which governs mood and cognition and sleep. We're going to spend all of our time talking about dopamine. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that gives you a sense of euphoria and, and reward and joy. It says, what you just did was really great. Let's keep it going. It has two very strong behaviors associated with it, compulsiveness and perseveration. And I want you to stop and think about those two behaviors. Incredibly helpful when it comes to surviving, right? A thousand years ago, 200 years ago, you needed to be compulsive about finding good, safe food and water, right? You needed to perseverate about finding a mate, right? Every night was the last thing you thought of before you went to bed, the first thing you thought of when you woke up in the morning, right? That's the way it's supposed to be. Your ancestors were good at those behaviors. Apply those two behaviors to addiction. They're not so helpful. The problem is, part of the definition of addiction is those two behaviors. And if we could pick this illness up out of this part of the brain and move it anywhere else in the brain, the visual cortex, the hearing system, and if we had an addiction, we just lost our peripheral vision or something, boy, it would be much easier to take care of. And instead, the part of the brain that impacts is this thing that is so deeply elemental to who we are as human beings. So some of us on this planet have naturally high dopamine levels, and there's no real way to measure this. There's no blood test that gets you your dopamine levels. But if all of us on average are sitting at a dopamine level of 100, some of us are happy-go-lucky, glass-half-full kind of folks, and we maybe have dopamine levels of 105 or 106. That's just luck. It's sometimes genetic, sometimes it's epigenetic, socialization, but that's lucky. There's some of us that don't look that good, though. Um, Skipping slides here, and we are sort of what I think of as the uh, the eors of the world. We're sort of slightly dysthymic. Nothing ever goes well. 
Uh, they're the really glass half empty kind of people. And I think people would say maybe their dopamine levels at a baseline are low. They're 85, they're 90. Most days they don't feel just great. So when you find, evolutionarily speaking, and 100 years ago and 1,000 years ago, when you find that perfect strawberry on a June day, and you've been starving all winter, waiting to find some fiber and some vitamin C so that you could actually improve your nutrition, you find that perfect June strawberry, your dopamine levels will spike to 150. Because you need to, you need that little reward spike so you will return to this very healthful food that your body is demanding. If you have sex, it's consensual, you have an orgasm, your dopamine levels will spike to 200. It is meant to be this way. These are things we want to return to. If you use cocaine, your dopamine levels will spike to 350. If you use any prescription opiate or heroin, your dopamine levels will spike between 500 and 900. And if you use crystal methamphetamine, your dopamine levels will go between 12 and 1300. So those are some lovely dopamine levels, right? And the question is, why aren't we doing that then? Like, why isn't everybody waking up every day with crystal meth? Because that seems like a great plan, right? That would make everybody feel great. So I'm not going to make everybody answer, but I think people might know the answer. And the answer's not because it's illegal. That's, it is maybe some of our answer, but there's a reason why we don't do this. So there's three things that govern the dopamine in our body. There's the amount we produce. There's the number of receptors on the other side receiving the dopamine messaging. And there's the number of reuptakes, which are the little vacuums that suck dopamine out of the synaptic cleft. And you can impact any one of those three things to increase it or decrease it. And I'm going to show you two fast drugs and just walk you through how they work. Um, the way that cocaine works is it turns off the reuptakes. So it turns off the vacuum, so there's nothing sucking the dopamine out of the synaptic cleft, and that's how you get yourself to a 350. The way that heroin works, or all opiates work, is it's a little more complicated because it goes through a mu opiate receptor, and then there's a negative feedback loop that goes through GABA, but at the end of the day, it pumps more dopamine out. So I said there were three things. I covered two drugs that have impact two of them. But we can do this with any addictive substances, and we can do this with any addictive behavior. Some of the pathways, somebody asked me, tell me the pathway of video game addiction. And I was like, I have absolutely no idea. Because some of the stuff, we don't really know all the different places where it interacts in the brain and how it goes through. But at the end of the day, almost always it involves a dopamine spike. So the way the brain sees this, though, if, if evolutionarily speaking, we have been in this form on this planet for 200,000 years, the brain is willing to see a dopamine of 150 or 200. But when it starts to see levels of 350, 500, 9, or 1,200, those are big numbers. The brain says, holy smokes, there's something wrong here. This is really too loud. There's too much dopamine. We need to down-regulate. We need to turn down the volume. And the brain's natural response to this is to stop making dopamine, to get rid of the receptors receiving the information on the other side, and to increase the number of vacuums sucking the dopamine out of the synaptic cleft. That's what the brain does. It does it naturally. It says, something's wrong. I need to fix this. So this down-regulation means that if my baseline, because I'm a happy person, is 105, I have that perfect strawberry, or I have an orgasm, my baseline returns to 100 afterwards. But with addiction, that first time you have that dopamine of 900, you'll never get a dopamine of 900 again. Maybe you'll get an 890 or an 870. It starts to descend. But over time, you never return to your baseline normal. You never get back to an 85 or 100. And in fact, your new dopamine set level is 40 or 45. And I can tell you that it is hard to get out of bed, it is hard to go to work, it's hard to pour a bowl of cereal or do anything positive in your life when your baseline dopamine is now 40 or 45. And I'm not talking about chasing a drug sickness or withdrawal. People are desperate to feel normal again. And that continued use has to do with, my gosh, I would do anything to have a day where I sat at 85. 85 was awesome compared to this pit where I live. So the reason why most of us in this room are not actively using crystal meth every day is not because we could explain this ahead of time, but because really none of us want to go there. And if, we, if everybody knew where they would end up, I think most people wouldn't get there, right? But it's not that simple. 
I'm sorry I keep turning around. It's a question of how good my pointer is, and I don't want to slip ahead, but I, I have no idea really what's behind me. <laughs> okay. So it, it leads to what I think of as a broken brain, right? Here we have this most fundamental part of the brain that's no longer working in a normal way. And one of the reasons I use this slide is it helps remind me to say to you that things that break often get better, right? Things heal. And, and if I don't actually cover it, let's talk at the end about what makes dopamine get better again. Okay, because we, we want to talk about that. So let's talk about another disease. Let's go, let's whip through how diabetes works. So a nice, normal, healthy body has a pancreas that makes insulin. Insulin attaches to an insulin receptor on a cell. When that receptor is activated, glucose gets sucked into the cell. That's what my body does. I don't have diabetes. Type um, 1 diabetes, the pancreas is not functioning, producing enough insulin. Consequently, there's nothing attaching to the receptor, and there's nothing that gets sucked in. Type 2 diabetes, the pancreas in general is working pretty well. There's usually enough insulin up until the very end. It's the receptor that's broken. And it has the same impact. There's no glucose that's getting sucked into a cell. The reason I make a point of this is that I just want to remind everybody that actually most every disease in your body has to do with an interruption in the transmission or the messaging system. Right? We can do the same kind of slide for the way with cardiovascular disease, plaques get laid down, right? There's an interruption, a disruption in the messaging systems. There's you know, more or less of these very complicated um, cardiology enzymes that create these problems. With the exception of infectious disease, everything looks this way. And so when people argue with me that this is not a real disease, this is just people being weak-willed, or they should pull themselves up by the bootstraps and get some religion and bad genetics, whatever it is that people push back on me, I think to myself, you know, I have an organ in my body, my brain, it's really the most complicated organ. And it, it, it breaks and, and, and gets better in the same ways that every other organ in our body does. And my point is, is that I, I like to remind people that most diseases look like this, a breakdown in the messaging system. So on the, on the right side there is a healthy brain, and everything that you're going to see in orange or bright yellow is healthy dopamine. And this is just to remind you that it's not me showing this stuff, making it up for late one night, but when you look at PET scans of healthy brains versus brains of addiction, you see in people who are addicted to any, any drug in this picture, their dopamine levels are close to zero. When you go drug by drug, that middle column is a control or normal um, column. So you see lots of orange as you go down. That far column to the right are people with an addiction. That first drug is um, cocaine. The next drug down is meth. The third one down is alcohol. And the final one is heroin. And I guess one of the things I like about this slide is I want you to notice that alcohol, in the person addicted to alcohol, there's still a lot of orange there. And it's one of the reasons why alcoholics, and there's a lot of us who struggle with alcohol um, in this country, it's one of those very quiet addictions that doesn't show up enough in the public forum, but a lot of us who struggle with alcohol, the wheels fall off the bus fairly late. We're fairly functional alcoholics. You're still showing up at work, you're still taking care of the kids, you may pass out drunk on the couch every night at nine, but you're still getting by, right? You're not necessarily robbing banks for it. So because it interacts with the GABA system and not directly with dopamine, people can last a longer time with alcoholism. And they never walk into my office saying they need help, right? It's a hard thing to actually find the people who are struggling with alcoholism. There's three things that predispose you to addiction. Not all of us get addicted. I said to you, 10% of us, 11% of us will struggle with addiction, which means 90% of us, 89% of us won't. But who's who? How do you know? We don't always know, right? Sometimes there is randomness that happens. But in general, these are things that we can say. The three things that will predispose you to having your disease of addiction. The first one is genetics. A genetic predisposition, which means parents or grandparents, not second cousins. That's not close enough, right? Um, the second one is early use or exposure. And the final one is a history of trauma. On some of my slides, I actually then have a picture that talks about mental health, because these three things actually interact with the level of mental health disorders, a mood disorder, depression, anxiety, which can also be a component of it. So let's talk about the genetic part. 50% of addiction is genetic in nature, which means that if one of your parents has an addiction, you have a 50% chance of having, having an addiction too. It is very hard in medicine to find any disease that is that genetic. It really is. I mean, people will walk into my office and say, I have lots of cancer in my family. And internally, I actually do a little eye roll where I think most cancer, really, is not genetic, right? It's very environmental. 
tobacco is the number one cause of, addiction, of, of cancer, right? It isn't what happened to your mother. Uh, the level of genetics with breast cancer is actually surprisingly small. Most breast cancers arrive de novo with very little genetic predisposition. There are very few diseases that have this kind of genetics. ADD um, has this kind of genetics. In fact, we often think that ADD may be 70%. And for those of us who are teachers or parents or have ADD ourselves, you sort of look around the family tree and there's not one person in that family. I never get any head nods in this room, but people know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. So, profoundly genetic. And you know who needs to know about their genetics? Our kids need to know about their genetics. And I tell you, most kids don't know. Not on addiction. They'll come in, I'll see a 12-year-old in my office, and they'll talk about cancers and other things. I know, because I often, as a family doctor, I take care of multiple generations in the family. I know a lot of the stories, and, and, and the kids often know too, quite honestly. They know that you know, dad's in jail because he is struggling with an alcohol use disorder. And I talk to the parents about the fact that, you know what, your 12-year-old needs to hear you say that, right? Not because it's a setup for them, or not because you're sharing private family information, it is a disease that has a lot of genetic predisposition, they can't control that part. That is just the part that gets assigned to them, but they can make better decisions about postponing use in order to decrease risk for themselves. So I'm a big fan of talking to your kids about your genetic risk in your family. And I've sat down with my kids and done this, right? Have I gone through everybody's throughout the entire tree? No, but I certainly love to know about their parents and their grandparents and where they're at risk. Okay, early youth. Early use, and the district attorney covered this in a nice way. But this is something that I would say the average pediatrician and the average family doctor, people who take care of uh, kids in the developmental stage, does not know. And if you look at the top of this, addiction is an adolescent or is a pediatric developmental disease. Every addiction starts during the time when the brain is in development. Every addiction. Now, I'm not saying that 12-year-olds are shooting heroin. I'm saying that when you talk to somebody who's really struggling with addiction, you ask the question, when did you start? What was your drug and when did you start? The easy ones are the answers normally. Marijuana, alcohol, or tobacco, and how old were you? And most often the answers are, I was 12, 13, or 14. You know, yesterday, I got an eight. Um, when I've given this talk in a jail, so I have 120 guys who are incarcerated for their disease of addiction, I ask that question. You know, I, I throw out the easies and I say, who is 12? Every hand is in the air at 12, every hand. But then I start counting down, partly because I'm kind of curious, right? How low does it go? And I start counting down 11, 10, 9, 8. Hands are dropping, but there's hand, lots of hands in the air, air at 8. 7, 6. I mean, I'm, my heart breaks every number I drop down, right? Because it makes me feel sick. But I still have hands in the air at the age of 6 years old. That's a first grader, and if you can imagine in your head what your first graders look like, the notion of lighting a match, or stealing a cigarette, or drinking alcohol. But everybody starts at some point during the developing brain period of time. And in fact, very good studies that specifically look at tobacco that say, if you have not smoked your first cigarette by the time you're 24, 25, 26, you will never smoke a cigarette, right? And in fact, I, I stand here and say, and it always makes me a little nervous, but I always do it, but that you won't develop the disease of addiction if you haven't started something before the age of 24. It is critical that it happens in the developing brain because it's the substances that help it go off track. And we're going to start diving in in a couple slides on sort of why this happens specifically, okay? So, um, similar topic. If you are 15 years old and you start drinking, and drinking here is defined as two drinks a week. So that's not a lot, it's a lot in a 15 year old, but two drinks a week, starting at the age of 15. Almost 40% of those kids go on to alcoholism, the disease of alcohol use disorder. If you wait until you're age 21, 7%. When we do this overlaid on top of genetics, so you take the same data and you apply whether there's a family history of genetics, if you can postpone use to the age of 21, it's like the genetics get canceled out. So it, when I say talk to your kids, it's because this is the thing they get to determine. 
If I knew one of my parents really struggled with addiction, and that I really needed to be one of those people that didn't start drinking at 15 or 17, that I needed to be one of those people who really had my first interaction with alcohol at 20 or 21, I actually think a lot of students would try to make that decision. They would be armed with that information, because right now, they know nothing. Oh, and that's that slide. I didn't think I showed this slide, but this is the one that overlays um, the green line is having a strong parental history. The red line is just early use. And what you see is over time, those numbers start to join together, right? They all become low. Right? The later you use, the better it is. Yeah? Um, so yes, to a certain extent, yes, right? Because if you have aunts and uncles, then you likely have grandparents, is what I would say to you on that front. Um, if you have just one uncle and everybody else, not so much, then I would say maybe not. So, but it is the case that in some, you know, we all have these families. I have families where I have siblings who struggle and siblings who don't, and, and uh, family trees that look that way. So my point being that if there's a couple aunts and uncles and a grandparent, then I would say yes, you're dealing with some generations, okay? But if you're talking one black sheep uncle and everybody else is good, then maybe not. Yeah. And this is just out of curiosity. So it sort of makes sense that our drinking age limits are 21. I'm just curious, does, does this sort of um, evidence hold up around the world where there are drinking ages? Yeah, I get, I, I get that question a lot. And so in Europe, and everybody uses it as a model, in Europe they start having glasses of wine at the age of eight or nine or 10 at the table, right? Let me be clear, the addiction rates in Europe are not lower than ours. They are not. And in fact, the addiction rates to alcoholism in Europe are higher in, in many countries. Um, they do not have the current heroin problem that we have, partly because they, their reliance on prescription opiates is really low. So the exposure to opiate pills in a young brain or in the 20s, is, it doesn't happen as often, but the addiction rates are just as high and in some countries higher. So um, there is a study that looks at what happens when you have your kids drink under your roof because you're the kind of parent who thinks, you know what, I think it's a great idea to uh, actually have the kids drink when I can supervise it. I don't want them going out and driving on the road on a Friday night after homecoming. I'm going to keep them in my basement. I'm going to invite whoever, all their friends over, right? Which one is against the law. We all know that in this room. But people, I think, are actually doing it because they think it's a good idea. They actually think there's benefit. And um, there's certainly benefit in not having kids who are drinking on the road. I don't disagree with that, right? But when they do studies, they look at the brains of these people who've been uh, exposed to alcohol at a young age, and what they have is a strong association between safety, love, um, everything's going well in my life, and alcohol are connected. And that's actually not a good relationship, because it puts this very strong association between alcohol is safe and good and loving, and that kid goes off to their first frat party and for, as, for, as freshmen, and I tell you, they're not on high alert for anything, right? They're somebody at risk for getting hauled up the back stairs at, at, a, at a frat party. So Nora Volkow, I'm going to talk a little bit about her, but she's the head of NIDA. Um, she does, she runs those studies looking at what it feels like to be drinking in the presence of your parents and then telling you it's all fine. It is not beneficial. Uh, now, would you mind getting me a little water? Is there any water? I'm so sorry. I'm not going to make it otherwise, I think. Uh, so the number one drug of abuse in our community, and this is nationwide, but it's true in our community. It's true here in Northampton. I think it's true in every town I know of. It's marijuana. Does that surprise anybody? No, okay, it's marijuana. Um, the number two, this is illicit drugs. So this is not, alcohol and tobacco are, are, are illegal. Marijuana is not yet legal. Um, the second one is stimulants. And one of the, I'm going to dive in a little bit on marijuana because I think um, I would say the disconnect between the perception of marijuana and um, that a lot of adolescents have and what we think of as good research on it, it they're very, um, they're in contradistinction to each other. And as the sense of harm has gone down with marijuana use, use has gone up. That happens all the time. As soon as risk, perceived risk goes down, use goes up. Um, and so what you see, not, you see nothing on that slide, but uh, what, what you see is that as the sense of harm of cigarettes has gone up, cigarettes have gone down, but the reverse is true for marijuana. So this is the way the brain works. Um, and again, anybody who wants these slides, I think that she must have a sign-up sheet somewhere, maybe it's outside. But 
when you look at the development of the brain, do you guys remember, for those of you who are moms or dads who saw your first prenatal ultrasound and you looked at that giant head inside of you and thought, oh my god, one, how is that getting out? But two, my baby has a massive head. Because the volume of the baby's brain is done. At the age of one, that's basically your head size. Your brain is as big as it's going to be. So there's things that happen early in brain development, and there's things that happen later. And very recently, in the last 25 years, we would have said brain development stops at the age of 12. We are very clear that brain development does not stop at the age of 12. And in fact, really critical things happen between the ages of 12 and 24. And, and that's the answer to anybody who in the room who's a student who gets asked that question. When is your brain done cooking? It's like 23, 24, 25. It's, it's actually, actually after you're out of college. So there's three steps that happen in this, this time period of adolescence. Um, and we're going to cover some of those. You can see them on this graph, these critical things that happen there. So the brain of the average maybe 12-year-old, this is an artistic representation on the left, has a lot of extra neurons. And there are tens of billions of neurons in the brain. Nobody needs that many. And one of the most important things that happens during adolescence is you prune the brain. You start snipping back pathways that are no longer necessary. This is critical. And this is why our amazing teenagers push the envelope and love sensation and love physical movement and sometimes do things that you think are absolutely crazy. They are exploring the world because their brain's job is to figure out what does it want to keep and what does it need to get rid of, right? Their brains aren't dysfunctional. They have nice, normal, healthy brains. They may make me crazy. They make you crazy. There's that huge, wide range of emotion. I mean, I have a 14-year-old who is the sweetest kid on earth and she is crazy in, in the same minute she's like this, right? But that's the way that teenage brain is supposed to work, because it is trying to sort out what needs to stay and what needs to go. So the first thing that it does is synaptic refinement, which I think of as pruning. So it has to get rid of about half of its connections. The other thing it does is it myelinates, or it sheets the brain. So it makes fast pathways, because myelination, it's like insulation, right? It makes pathways that are moving quickly. Um, and it turns a brain that uh, it turns a brain looking like this that could have looked like this. So it's trying to make more order of a brain that has too many neurons is not particularly ordered. So I'm going to talk a little bit about marijuana because um, I think a lot of us don't have great understanding. And there is a good talk by a, a really well-known researcher at Children's Hospital. It's next Wednesday night at Mount Holyoke. Do people know about that? Um, and I'm looking around at Paul. Dr. Susan Anderson. Dr. Susan Anderson from Children's Hospital is speaking at Mount Holyoke next Wednesday, the 30th. I don't know what time it is. Seven. Seven, okay. She's a, uh, I haven't ever heard her speak. I just actually came back from a children's talk on marijuana. Um, she's supposed to be really good. I think for those of you who are curious about this stuff or figuring out where you're going to go with this ballot measure that uh, likely we'll be voting on, I, I, she, I hope you could attend that talk. So one of the things I'm going to say is that THC, which is the um, cannabinoid that we're most familiar with from marijuana, the reason it has such an impact on the brain is it looks exactly the same as something called anandamine. This is the natural, normal endocannabinoid in our brain. Right? Marijuana works in the brain because we have this receptor that it's supposed to click to, except what really clicks to this thing is a nice, normal, um, naturally appearing an endocannabinoid called anandamine, okay? So, oh, I'm sorry. All those purple spots on the brain are places where anandamine receptors exist. So that's a lot. When you look at that purple spots on the brain, it's the entire cortex, right? The cortex, that outer part of the brain, the slow reason, put your brakes on, that is the part of the brain that develops last, right? That's the part of the brain that our kids are making right now. Our 12 to 24s are building that part. And that's where all of those anandamide receptors go. You see there's only one part of the brain they don't go. They don't go to the brain stem, which is why people don't overdose for marijuana, because the brain stem is where the respiratory center is. But everywhere else, boy, there's a lot of places where this really critical endocannabinoid attaches. So the problem is, is that THC, which comes from marijuana, is much more powerful than our naturally occurring ones. And it takes the place of the natural anandamides in the brain and boots it out. So it has this enormous ability to really impact what the brain is doing, and specifically what this our naturally occurring neurotransmitter does is it makes the decision about what gets to go and what stays. 
It makes decisions about synaptic um, refining or the pruning, and it makes the decisions about what gets myelinated, what pathways get insulated. So for those people who think that marijuana is a benign drug, that it's not as bad as alcohol, that it's naturally occurring and it's fine, which is what every teenager says to me in my office, I will argue with you that I actually don't care what an adult does with marijuana as long as they don't get behind a wheel of a car and actually impact anybody else's life, but I tremendously care what happens to a developing brain with marijuana because it has an enormous impact and more and more data is coming out on this and I feel like our level of knowledge in the community about the developing brain in marijuana is very low. So do we do great studies in this country on marijuana? No, we don't. And why is that? Because you don't get federal funding to study illegal drugs, right? That's part of the problem. And to run a big study, you need millions of dollars. So the data in this country on marijuana, it stinks. And in fact, if you really want to run a study in this country, you've got to use some pot that's grown in some field, a federal field in Alabama, that is not remotely similar to what's actually being used at Pioneer High School right now. So it's not a useful study. Um, so most of the good studies actually come out of New Zealand and out of Australia. This is the best known New Zealand study, um, is known as the Dunedin study. And what it did is it followed people from teenagehood all the way up to the age of 35. And it followed people who started using marijuana at a young age, and it looked at them um, 25 years later. And what this study showed, it actually showed a, a lot of different things, but the fast one is that there was an eight point drop in IQ, and a real slowing in cognition, and an overall sense of my life is not going well between those two groups. So again, a study that was considered very well done that looked at early exposure and what it does to the brain. Um, this is the New Zealand study that is a totally distinct one. This looked at just high school graduation rates for people using marijuana at the age of 13, 14, and 15. And then the second one was um, university, entering uh, scores for your university scores. And you can see there's a significant difference between these two things. This is not good for cognition, it's not good for memory, it's not good for performance. I am never going to be promoting marijuana use in a teenager, ever. Right? If they have cancer and they're dying, of course. Right? Palliative care, if it really makes a difference, of course. But I think as we all know, when marijuana is available in our community, whether it is legal, illegal, and medical dispensary, teenagers get it. So uh, the other thing I want to say about marijuana is that whatever was being used in the 60s, 70s, and 80s is not today's marijuana. When you look at the THC content, the really psychoactive substance content of today's marijuana, it is often four or five or six times more concentrated than it, um, it used to be. So on average, most THC is running between 9% and 17% in most plants. It used to run between 1% and 3%. So even those studies that I showed you out of New Zealand and Australia were based on marijuana that was 1% to 3% THC. I don't know, what the heck did the studies show at 16%? Who knows, right? But I can tell you, it doesn't feel good. Um, and the other thing I'm going to say, this is to the adults in the room. If I show these pictures to the average adult, they're like, uh, that's marijuana? Like, I don't see a nice big fat roll joint up here. What is this stuff? Right? This is today's marijuana use. And the concentration of these things ranges tremendously, but some of this, and in fact, that product in the bottom middle, which some people call earwax because it sort of looks like that, um, in its hash oil that gets dab, the verb is dab, that, is, that ranges between 70 and 80% THC. This is the stuff where you take the actual plant and you force butane through it, and this is what you're left with. This is incredibly intense product. Um, this is the stuff that explodes houses. We had a not so far away house explode that was doing this. The burn units in Colorado are filled with individuals trying to produce this product. When you go into the medical marijuana dispensaries and the dispensaries in general in Colorado, have people been through these? Okay, anybody taking a trip to Colorado? Is it a worthwhile venture just to look? It's pretty interesting, a little field trip, okay. Um, so you can tell, what do we have? We have Nutella, we have pot tarts, we have a honey pot tea, we have, that's a, ner a Nestle Crunch over there, gummy bears. Edibles, right? Edibles that are made with hash oil that have between 50 and 70% THC. 
um, are being sold. Now, I can tell you, if you have HIV and AIDS cachexia, and you're just no longer able to eat, and your body is wasting away, I guarantee you, you are not popping gummy bears, right? This stuff is made and marketed to our children. And we used to say that nobody has ever died of marijuana. That actually used to almost be true, but it's no longer true thanks to Colorado. Because kids get their hands on this stuff, and here I am saying to you that you, know, you won't die of a respiratory failure from marijuana, but when you're five-year-olds and seven-year-old and you ingest some of these things, it kills you. So we have at least two pediatric deaths in, marijuana, uh, in Colorado from marijuana. And again, this is an industry that exists to make money. There's a great article that um, I asked to put up, and I'm going to talk about it for a second. It's, this is a worthwhile read, and, and I can't remember your answer. Is there a way to get it posted somewhere? It's on the American Convention Coalition's Facebook page. Okay, so it's on the Facebook page. It's a New England Journal article, and I know not everybody else has a subscription. But I, found, I found this article so convincing. Because what this article is about is where big tobacco became big marijuana. So let's talk about tobacco for a second. Okay, so tobacco, is it addictive? Is it little bit or a lot? A lot. A lot. In fact, in terms of substances, the most addictive substance is sugar, right? 94% of rats get addicted to sugar within like two days. But next is nicotine. Nicotine is really the most addictive substance out there. But it didn't used to be that way. In the 1800s, like nobody smoked. I mean, even Native Americans, like this is a native plant. Nobody used this stuff. It wasn't particularly addictive, right? But by 1950, Half of this country was using cigarettes. And why was that? It, it, big tobacco, because they intensified it. They added 300 different chemicals to it. They had a delivery system that brought it into this delicious pink tissue called your lungs and then dispensed it throughout your body rapidly, right? They were able to change the drug itself by making it more addictive, right? They changed the quality of the product and they changed the delivery system. And do you remember what I just showed you? I just showed you marijuana that's been changed in the product and has been changed in the delivery system. And you know what, if we could all go back in time and say, wow, legalizing tobacco was a bad idea, I would argue that in the next 20 or 30 years, we're gonna look back at this time in history and think, was it really a good idea to have yet another psychoactive substance available to our kids? Was that a really good thing that I voted yes to make marijuana legal? I would argue strongly not. This is an awesome read. So go to the Northampton Prevention Coalition's Facebook page. I, I, I sent them a PDF because I thought this read was so impressive. Um, when you look at what happened in Colorado, I could spend all night talking about Colorado, um, but the city in Denver has the highest rate of teen marijuana use in the country, right? It really is the mile high city. It did not used to be this way but put dispensaries everywhere where you can't buy it as a teen, people divert out of those places all the time. And for all the teenagers that entered into treatment in Denver, Colorado, they said they got medical marijuana that had been diverted and had used it at least 50 times. And that's a worry for me in a town like Northampton, right? Because I've been to your medical dispensary and it's lovely and you cannot walk in there without an ID and your certificate. It is a tight place. But the minute you walk out of there with your product, you can give it to anybody you want. So I can tell you, there is stuff getting diverted out of your medical dispensary, and it will be diverted out of my medical dispensary, and it ends up in the teenage brain. And if I can guarantee that no teenager gets this stuff while the brain's developing, I'm in. But I know it doesn't work that way. Okay, you know what? Here's some good news. Cigarettes. Cigarettes are way down. Look how low cigarettes are. We have never had lower smoking tobacco ever in the history. 5.3% of, of high school seniors are smoking cigarettes. What's gone up, though, is e-cigarettes. Um, did you guys have, like, a vape shop or a head shop tobacco? I don't know what you call it here, right? Do you guys have one in town? Has anybody ever been in there, checked it out? You guys need to do more field trips. I go in these places all the time. You, somebody's been back there, right? So what we know is when we look at the national data, the 2015 da data on um, exposure to nicotine, cigarette smoking in the paper package form, way down. But the number of our kids who are vaping or using e-cigarettes is way up. And what do we think about that? Is that fine, no big deal? Right, because even though most of these teenagers say we're just vaping the flavored ones, we're just using watermelon bubblegum flavor today, the truth is there's no, there's no regulation of this industry, right? There's no Food and Drug Administration regulation. 
So these products could have anything in them, including nicotine, and we do not know. And when and if this market gets shut down, we're left with a category, a generation of kids who actually now have a nicotine addiction, which is the last thing we wanted. We spent the last 30 years on a public health mission to get rid of tobacco, and we're left with this stuff. How did this happen? I've been to schools in the East where as many as 60% of the high school seniors are routinely vaping at school. And it's undetectable, right? Because it has no odor, right? You can vape anything. You can, in my high school, where my kids go to school at Pioneer, I'm a school doctor, so I always find things out, but they're vaping hemp oil, right? Like, first of all, if they're vaping some oil into their lungs, that can't be good. We see, we see radiographic images of that later, it looks terrible. But they're doing it because they're desperate to do anything to try new things. These are not good products. I wish all of them were off the market. They do not really help people stop smoking. They may reduce the smoking, but not a lot. You have a question. Yeah, caffeine is addictive. Yeah, so caffeine. Does anybody think caffeine is addictive? <laughs> right. Okay. It is addictive, right? Um, it meets the standard of addiction. Are you going to rob a bank for your cup of coffee tomorrow? <laughs> Oh, it doesn't have an adverse effect. So um, we've done lots of studies on caffeine, and interestingly, it not only does not have an adverse effect on the brain, but drinking five eight-ounce cups of coffee a day is actually beneficial to long-term mortality. You get extra years on your life. Now, having said that, I know that seems crazy, but caffeine actually seems to have some health benefits. It's easy to go over, right? There's not there's a tipping point where you get too much, and we all know what people Dunkin' Donuts cups look like. Like I'm talking eight ounces, whatever a normal size mug used to be. But so there's health benefits, but it is addictive. Truly, we crave it. It often is the last thing I think of before I go to bed, so I have some perseveration, some compulsive behavior, and people can have continued use despite harm. And the, the, the thing I think about that was pregnancy. So you get pregnant and you're like, oh, I'm pregnant, awesome. And then whoever's taking care of you says, caffeine needs to go to eight ounces or less instantly. And you're like, what? Right? I'm sitting there, I have my Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee on your counter. And I'm like, yeah, that's it, you're down to nothing. It is very hard for pregnant women, and I can speak for myself on this one, to bring it rapidly down. So you have this continued use to spike heart. So yes, addictive, but not bad health consequences unless you have Unless it makes you sick, it gets you tachycardia, it flips you into AFib. I mean, all of us have individual differences. Okay, so I'm going to talk to the parents in this room. So we as parents have a huge impact on what our kids see and think and do. And I'm going to specifically talk about alcohol here. One third of us in this country drink zero, nothing. And I ask this question of almost every patient I see. What's your relationship with alcohol? And when they say, I don't drink at all. I used to go right beyond that, because I'm like, oh my god, I'm running behind, I have like 12 more patients. But now I say, tell me why you don't drink. Because there's often a story there. And sometimes they say, I never developed a taste for it, but sometimes they'll say, I don't drink because I'm an alcoholic and I haven't had a drink in 30 years. And I think, duh, I didn't know that, nobody's ever told me that. Or they'll say, my mom was a drop down drunk and I don't want to turn out like her. That's really helpful information for them. For me, it just acknowledges something about their genetics that I didn't know, right? So I don't skip over that question. Uh, the middle third of us drink a little bit, one to two drinks a month. What, I, what people will say is sort of a light social drinker. And the final one third of us in this room drink all the rest of the alcohol. And in fact, the final 10% of us drink on average eight to 10 drinks a day. Now, there you go, my oh my God. Because people are like, that's not possible. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's possible, right? <laughs> um, because this is what it takes to get your drink. It's one beer, it is five ounces of wine, or it's one and a half ounces of hard liquor. So when I ask this question, and I do it really routinely of almost everybody, I'll ask the average woman, so what's your relationship with alcohol? I'll have a couple glasses of wine at night. And I'm like, oh yeah, how much is in your wine glass? Oh, I don't know, you know, a normal wine glass. <laughs> so I want to be clear that normal wine glasses are not five ounces, right? Your grandmother's very old wedding set that nobody uses anymore, that's a five ounce wine glass. People drink giant goblets of wine. They have those mason jars on a stem, right? We all know those. <laughs> and there's no more targeted market than women these days for alcohol. Look at these bottles of wine. I could have paid, pulled hundreds of pictures on this one. Women, and I'm gonna, men don't be appalled or, or offended by what I'm about to say. Women work really hard. A lot of us work jobs. We get up at five, we start the laundry, we sweep the floor, we get the dog out, we go to work. I come home every day and I'm like, are you kidding me? I've been at work all day and the house is a mess in the kitchen. The breakfast dishes didn't get put away, nobody entered the dishwasher. And it looks to me like you've been like watching TV instead of doing your homework. And I had eight more hours of work. 
And women's response to this is glug, 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 glug. And I can't tell you now how often I am diagnosing an alcohol use disorder of women, age 25, 35, 42, professional women just like me, who've developed a really unhealthy relationship with alcohol. Um, and in fact, the ratios, it used to be a nine to one ratio between men and women with alcohol use disorder, and now it's three to seven. And this happened in the last 20 years. This is a rapid shift that we're seeing. I mean, I'm talking, you know, how many thousands of years have we had alcohol? A long time. So this is a rapid shift that's happening, and it's because it's being marketed to women. There's a sense that it's fine. But I can tell you, let me, let's talk about the message that goes home to your kids. When you walk in the door, and you're mad, and you've had a terrible day at work, and you're yelling at them, and they see you glug, 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 right? They say that the way you manage your stress and your misery and your anger is to drink. A lot of us do this behavior, and I just want all of us to pause and ask yourself about your personal relationship with alcohol and what it is your kids see. I speak as a physician. Physicians have a really high rate of addiction because lives can be stressful or feel out of control. It's a lot of self-medication. Um, but I like to imagine walking in the door and saying, man, I had a terrible day today. I just, I, I'm almost in tears. Will you go walk the dog with me? I hate my boss. I'm thinking of quitting my work. Can you just go sit down with me in the other room and, and, and just do a 10-minute meditation? Because that would make me feel better. What if that was the model we gave to our kids instead of drinking it through? Because that's what many of us do. Okay. I'm going to dive in on something that now is going to feel like I'm totally off topic. So we covered three, two of the three things. We talked about genetics and we talked about early use. The final thing I'm going to talk about in terms of who is at risk for addiction is a history of trauma. Um, and this may seem like I'm a total nut up here, but I hope, I hope I'm going to bring you around on the subject. So in 2007, a really important study came out of Kaiser in San Diego. It was a big study because Kaiser's huge. They have, you know, hundreds of thousands, and they likely have millions. I don't know how many people belong to Kaiser. But this was a study that surveyed 17,000 people. And it was done because the, the lead investigator was interested in why it is that people, adults with massive obesity, when you're in medical school, and for the medical people in the room, maybe you'll nod your head on this, you are taught that people with massive obesity often have a history of sexual trauma. And we find that often to be true, but then we always think, is this something we created? Is this mythology? Is this real? So this guy put together this study, looking what he thought would be just on adult obesity. It's 10 questions. Um, their answers are yes or no. And I'm going to read some of the questions because they're going to be hard to read, but I want you to have a sense of what we're talking about, okay? And it is worth going back and looking at this study if anybody is further interested. It's called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. So, did a parent or another adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you? Ever hit you so hard that you had marks or you were injured? Were you ever sexually assaulted? Did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special? That your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other? Did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you? Your parents were too high or too drunk to take care of you or take you to the doctor if needed? Were your parents ever separated or divorced? Was there anybody in your family who was incarcerated? Did you have a family member with major mental illness? Ten questions, yes or no. So this was a measure of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. And what this guy did was just think about adult obesity. And what he didn't realize is that this study showed it was a predictor for actually every chronic disease out there. If you scored a four or higher on an ACE score, you had a higher risk of dying, you had a higher risk of a heart attack, you had a higher risk of emphysema. What's the connection there? You had a higher risk of more sexual partners. You had a very strong predisposition to addiction and a much higher risk of developing the disease of chronic pain. So this thing became something that nobody anticipated, which was a really well-studied, really well-run study that actually impacts the outcome of multiple chronic diseases. And I have to say, the CDC and many other governmental institutions are spending a huge amount of time understanding childhood trauma and what it means for all of us as adults. A lot of schools are now trying to understand trauma more. Because kids who are suffering through trauma, they don't do well in the classroom, right? They look very reactive. They have this really hyper response to really not big deal situations. 
they tend to be very disconnected or actually um, sometimes disassociated, just not very present, or very inattentive. They often have a lot of mood issues, depression and anxiety. They often look like a kid with ADD, but they don't have ADD. And we medicate these kids for ADD, but again, we're missing a diagnosis here. Because these kids really need excellent trauma-informed treatment, and most of our communities aren't very good. I'm in Northampton, and what do we have here? We actually have fabulous trauma-informed treatment. Is there anybody here from the Northampton Trauma Institute, which is in Florence? I tell you, man, that place is cutting edge, doing all the right work, um, but that place is rare, is what I will say. Um, so, and, and I'm just, for those of you again who think I'm wacky on this, I just want you to imagine what happens when your body is in trauma. All of us have a nice, normal, physiologic fight-or-flight response. You're being chased by a bear, you need to run really fast, you need to vasoconstrict, you need to get to your cave. After two hours, you're fine, you shelter down, you recover, right? That is that adrenaline spike, and then you get back to normal, right? That's the way we are designed to be. But if you put somebody who's living in a household where they don't know if they're going to have enough food tomorrow, where they don't know if their mom is good, dad's going to hurt their mom, where they don't know if their little sister is safe, when you're living in a household with that much stress, and that much anxiety, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, your cortisol levels, your adrenaline, fight or flight is on all the time, right? And it's on all the time for years on end. And it has a huge impact on every organ development in the rest, for the rest of your life. This stuff is really important to get at. Most of us as a society are not able to address it. So I'm going to skip this one. I'm just going to remind people, and this is actually a shout out to our young people in the room. Actually, most of our adolescents make awesome decisions. They really do. When you look at alcohol rates, it has gone down. Since the 1980s, gone down. Each year, statistically significant decrease. Cigarettes, I already covered that one. I love those numbers. I like nobody smoking cigarettes. And our teenagers are making awesome decisions around that. When you look at other drug use, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, pills, whatever, it's been pretty flat. There's been no change in that. But just a shout out to today's teens who actually make mostly great decisions, right? And in fact, people, kids who don't use drugs or, or tobacco or alcohol define the norm. It's just that they're not the ones you hear about, right? They're not the ones who show up on a Monday morning talking about the Dungeons and Dragons game they played on Friday night, right? It's the kids who parties all night that you hear from. Okay, so I just want to, I got, everybody probably thinks I'm always going to talk about opiates because it's one of my interests, but I am going to just talk a little bit about opiates. So this is the Greenfield Recorder, which is my local paper, and every morning I get up and I read the obituaries because I'm a negative person and I have low dopamine, but I don't. Instead, I read the obituaries because I'm a doctor and I take care of a lot of people who are old and are dying, and I like to know every morning who died last night. I just need to know, I have to call people, I need to sign hospice, fill out death certificates. It's my ritual every morning. And one morning in December of 2000. In 12, I woke up and I saw the, uh, not the face, but I read the story of that young woman in the upper left whose name is Ashley Sims. And her obituary read, Ashley Sims, age 21, died of a heroin overdose at home. And I thought to myself, oh my God, Ashley died, because I knew her and I knew her grandmothers who raised her. And I called them to express my profound um, sympathies at her loss, but also to thank them for telling the truth about how she died. Because for years I've been reading these obituaries of young people who died at home and thought, why did they die? Like, what is going on? Although oftentimes I knew them, I knew why they died. So these grandmothers went to our local paper and said, you need to tell the story of what is happening in our communities with opiate overuse and heroin use and how people are overdosing and how some people are dying. And the Greenfield Recorder ran with this, what was just fabulous series talking. And I, you know, the local paper down here, they're all owned by the same company, right? Hampshire Gazette, that Greenfield Recorder? It's also a company. But all the newspapers have covered this topic, I think, pretty well, right? And, and that the level of community knowledge on the subject is pretty high, I think. I mean, not everybody, but lots of people know it. So um, this is just a picture that talks about the fact that uh, pills are on the hook for creating the worst opiate, worst sort of public health epidemic that this country has seen. Um, that uh, the data that looked at using opiates for non-malignant, non-acute, non-cancer pain was terrible, right? The studies, and again, for the doctors and prescribers in the room, pain is the fifth vital sign, sounds really, really familiar. And we were told, this is safe, no one will get hurt, no, it's not addictive, this stuff is tamper-proof, nothing bad will happen, use as much as you want. 
I lived through this. I was a doctor in the 1990s, and I prescribed because they told me it was fine to prescribe. A lot of this stuff is based on a single study with 38 patients. So for those of you who are researchers, 38 is a small n. And in this study, two of the 38 got addicted. But again, the notion that we put out high volumes of opiates without concern that these are actually dangerous drugs that some people get addicted to was based on this. It's appalling. Like This is like medicine at its worst. Yeah. Did uh, Fitzlake, that we're giving the audience know, there's a great book uh, written by San Finoni's called Dreamland. Yeah which really covers this in great detail. When you talk about how this article generated out of Boston Hospital, there's really a one or two page but everybody who did the research or allegedly did research at uh, Purdue cited it and said how non-addictive these substances were. It's a great read. If you have a chance to get it from the library, get it. It's called Dreamland. At the, at the end of my talk, I show a picture of that book. At the end of my talk, I show four books that I think are great reads, and that's one of them. So thanks for bringing that one up. Um, so, again, I think a kindergartner in the 1990s could have drawn this graph. The more you prescribe opiates, the more people will get uh, addicted and need treatment for opiates, and the more people will die from opiates. That's what we know now. Um, I like this slide because I'm a public health person. I like to think about how it is that we live and thrive and how it is that we die. So when you look at this slide, this looks really complicated. In the bottom, in the little bars that go to the left, these are places where we have improved mortality, where fewer people have died between the years of, years of 2000 and 2010. So a single decade that's pretty, pretty recent. And what you see there is that death by motor vehicle accidents um, has decreased. And why is that? Speed limits, safer cars, airbags, seatbelts, so there's a seatbelts, yeah, all those things. Death by influenza and pneumonia decreased. Why? Yeah, vaccines have done that. Aortic aneurysms, that's the place we've had the best improvement. Anybody know why aortic aneurysm death has decreased so much? What was the word? What's it that people are saying? Oh, stents? Oh, no. No, aspirin's almost a useless drug on that front, actually. Smoking. Actually, going down on smoking, reducing smoking improves death rate from aortic aneurysms more than anything else. So that's a public health measure, right? I used to say it was the aortic scans. Maybe that's what people say are scans. That has had a 0.4% uh, decrease. It has a very small impact, even though I want to believe it has a big impact. So when you look at the numbers where more people die, you know what we have? We have an epidemic of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Do we really have an epidemic of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's? People are old, right? People are unbelievably old, and at some point, you're going to get some diagnosis attached to your death certificate, right? When you're 100, I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know how she died, right? I think she was pretty demented at the end, though, right? Because you, add, you know, for those of us who fill out death certificates, sometimes you just don't know. You take some guesses. Most of those diseases that have increased in the last 10 years have to do with the fact that none of us are ever going to die. We live forever. So end-stage renal disease, Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's will go up because we live forever. When you look at this, two things have gone up dramatically. One is suicide, and the other one is the 276% increase in death by opiates. The reason I like this slide is it demonstrates sort of on a public health scale this one thing that went off the charts, right? Really, it's hard for me, and I, I, one of the reasons I do this work is I'm a doctor who is part of the problem, and because I'm a doctor who likes to think she's part of the solution as well, um, but that this is, it's hard for me to find anything in medicine that we ever did this wrong, that we ever got this wrong that harmed more people. I think about it all the time, right? Tuskegee, lobotomies, they're all bad. And this is a big number of people that get impacted. So when you look at the country, that top map, anything in red is a place where there's high rates of overdose by drugs. So when you look at that top map, what lights up initially, you see Appalachia on that map. Right? When I say Appalachia, people sort of know roughly what I'm talking about. You see that light up. You see New Mexico, parts of New Mexico light up on that top map. And a little bit of Florida starts to light up. And then five years pass, so now I'm in 2004, 2005 in that middle map, and you see a lot more red, right? Florida starts to light up. You start to see Maine get lit up. You look at the entire Southwest is lit up. And then five more years pass, and that bottom map is six years ago. Six years ago, that's like a million years ago. And you see how much red is on that bottom map. Those red areas, high incidences of death by overdose. That central part of the country, which is pretty rural, is um, fairly untainted. Uh, I'm going to skip this one because it's a similar slide. 
I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to skip this one just for time's sake. So one of the things I'm going to say is that most of the opiates that came to New England came from Florida. And that for those of us who were following the story for the last 20 years, we would call I-95 like Oxy Highway. We just had that expression. The stuff came up from Florida. And that is because Florida had over a 1,000 pain clinics. They were in strip malls. They were known as pill mills. If you were a doctor who worked there, you could both write prescriptions, but you could also dispense the drugs. So you got to be like the prescriber and the pharmacist all at once. It's one of the definitions of a pill mill. You get to do both. That's against the law in Massachusetts. It's against the law, I think, in every New England state. So they would have these tour buses go down from Kentucky, Ohio, Maine, and they would say, you get three free nights in Florida, and all your meals paid for, and a nice air-conditioned bus. Your job is to go into two pain clinics a day. You don't need to limp. You don't need a cane. Just walk on in. Tell them you have migraines or fibromyalgia. They will give you your meds. You hand them over to me. So the tour bus operator would collect the bags of meds and prescriptions, and then would go back to oh, Kentucky and Ohio and other places and sell them. So these drugs were coming to us from the fine, fine state of Florida. In 2010, the federal government looked at that fine state and said, we will cut off all federal funding. You get no more highway money, no more education funds. You need to get yourself under control because you're, you're making the rest of the country terribly ill. So the problem is, when they shut down the vast majority of those pill mills and incarcerated 37 doctors for a long time for being not doctors with American medical licenses, but drug dealers, what do people with addiction in Ohio and Kentucky and Maine have left? Right. And if you think the cartels in Mexico weren't ready for this, right, and that's part of what that story tells you, they were watching this happen. They knew what they, they were stationed in every little small town, ready to go. Because this stuff was available and it was cheap. And the, uh, what this slide shows you, that top slide is the purity of the drug and the bottom slide is the cost. It got more and more pure and it got cheaper and cheaper. It's pretty cheap in Northampton. It's pretty cheap in Holyoke. It's cheap in my little town. It gets more expensive the further north you go. So, you know, right now it's running sometimes four bucks a bag, some places three fifty. In Maine, it may be six or eight bucks a bag. It's more expensive. Um, in those green, dark green areas, those are regions where emergency medical workers will say, my number one drug of concern is heroin. What's wrong with the southeast? Why is the southeast not lighting up there? Other drugs. Other drugs is the answer. That is actually the answer, right? No, not meth, actually. Not in the southeast. And actually, thank God, meth is on the downswing, partly because he got really good heroin. But the answer is other drugs, and let's look at this one here. <laughs> which is those dark purple states are states where, on average, everybody got last year between one and one and a half bottles of opiate prescriptions. Which meant everybody in this room got one or one and a half bottles, those dark purple states. So those are states where there's still a tremendous amount of prescription and likely over-prescription of opiates. So it's not that pain is worse in Mississippi and Arkansas. Right? I don't think that's the case. But if you can imagine then, Mental snapshot of this, this slide. When you look at the country and ask, where's heroin the problem? It's us, right? We're red. New England's red. Illinois's red. Heroin's our number one problem. The CDC came out with their new guidelines last week. The FDA just endorsed their new guidelines. I mean, everybody knows that Governor Baker just signed incredibly restrictive, um, in some ways, legislation two weeks ago. When those purple states start having to cut back on their opiates, Right? When all of those one to one and a half bottles disappears, every one of those purple states will become a red state. And if you think, and I'm going to be regionally incredibly judgmental here, but if you think that Mississippi and Alabama and Kentucky and these other states are going to have Narcan in their schools and in their patrol cars and are going to be having forums like this and they're going to be uploading every doctor in sight to help manage addiction, I don't think that's going to happen. And I think we have the next eight to 10 years with tens of thousands of heroin overdoses or beyond that in all those states. Like this problem has not gotten any better in the state. We're, we're focusing on it tremendously, but our numbers for 2015 were higher than 14, and the 2016 numbers thus far look worse than 2015. And this is the great state of Massachusetts, right? Where public health actually matters and we try to fund things. Okay, so where do our teenagers get exposed to opiates? By prescription, they get exposed in a handful of ways. They get injured, right? They get injured, they break a femur, they have an ACL tear because they're a female soccer player, right? Those are common places. Wisdom teeth, right? Your wisdom teeth come in at age 18, 
17, whenever, you get them removed. Who's had wisdom teeth or root canal in this room? Oh yeah, me too. And, and how many opiates were you prescribed? Just shout it out. 30. 30. Zero? Zero. Okay, 12. 12 is a nice number. A 10 day supply, meaning you take something every four hours? No, I think it's just one a day. Oh, one a day for 10 days. You make 10, okay. So those drugs last four to five hours, so that's a weird prescription, but so I'm hearing 10, I'm hearing 12, I'm hearing 30. But those were the, years ago. That was 10 years ago. So those are better numbers than I usually hear, because we would used to hear 60, right? 60, are you kidding me? But even 30, so the person who, used, who got 30, could you use 30? No, I got my son. Oh. So you use and zero I, of a third. Yeah. When I went back and I said, this is actually really outrageous that you really appreciate it. And he didn't eat it. Like he, he was like, no, Harlow. He, he, you know, he took a problem or whatever. And they said, we were so sick of people calling and wanting more that we just gave a higher number. Right. So that's yeah. inexcusable. Yeah. That's, yeah. What, that was a long ago, right? Because you're yeah. young and you have a 17 year old and you, you had it sort of really, you were forced to really fill it. Now I have to say, that's lazy on their, on their part, right? I have an office where I'm called 24-7. I don't fill scripts for OPs at midnight. I don't do that. But having said that, and most everybody I talk to says I had my wisdom teeth or my root canal, and I used zero, two, four. Every now and then I get a six. One time in the back of the room, somebody, some guy said I used all 60. And I said, you did? Was something wrong? And he said, I'm an addict. And I said, I got it, right? <laughs> rest of us in general don't need it. And I, when my kid had massive oral surgery, I looked at the oral surgeon and he knew exactly who I was and the work I did. And his little hand is hovering, sort of trembling over that prescription pad. And he wrote me for 15 and I said, I'm not feeling this. He said, please take it. I was like, okay. And I did what you did. Tylenol Motrin, Tylenol Motrin distraction. Tylenol Motrin, Tylenol Motrin distraction. Done. Like she was fine. No opiates. And so what I'm going to say to you, and I want to be clear here, if your kid is suffering, your kid is you know, sickle cell disease, they break their femur, you know, something big, you're gonna give them an opiate, but who's gonna manage their opiate for them? You are, you're the adult. I cannot tell you how often I take care of a 24 year old who says, I was home alone, I had my wisdom teeth out, I had my full bottle, and I tipped the whole thing back, and I've never felt better in my entire life, right? And then they call, they got a refill, then another refill, and then that kid's off and running. So I have to be very clear. If you have somebody in your house who has a developing brain and they're given an opiate for legitimate reason, an adult is managing that medicine. And you're gonna use a lot of Tylenol and Motrin in alternating fashion as long as somebody tells you that's an okay thing to do, okay? Um, so, I'm gonna skip that one. So I'm gonna skip a little bit of the stuff you're getting. So just signs and symptoms you might have at home that your kid is struggling. When I take care of those 21 year olds and they come in with their parents, um, the parents will remind me, the people in this room that work with Learn to Cope or have their own kids struggling, like all this stuff is familiar, like pawn slips, missing money, missing jewels, missing silver. Um, I'm going to show you a picture here that describes some of the things, and this is a nice Learn to Cope um, uh, slide that I, that I took from them, but it shows you things that parents will come back and say they found in their kids' room. So that first week I see them, I'm helping the kid, I'm helping the parents understand the disease of addiction, I look at the parent and I say, you need to go through the kid's room and I need it cleaned out. I need everything emptied out. I need furniture moved out of the room. I need it have empty. Because I need you to find what's in that room and get rid of it. Because there's little babies and stuff. And they come back with these big wide eyes and I'm like, how'd it go for you? And they say, I found, and I'm like, I know. So they'll find hundreds or thousands of these little baggies, right? Those little baggies are in my middle slide there, but little plastic bags that have a zipper. Sometimes they're made out of wax and they fold over, right? But you get, in the beginning, you're kind of cautious when you're struggling with your addiction, but you know, halfway through or towards the end, you're just actively using at home, right? Like, you just are, and this, you get sloppy. And some of the stuff I'm going to show you on the slide, you know, there's anything that's rolled up that you can snort through, that dollar bill, the inside of broken pens, pills. I'll be honest, I don't think pills belong in your kid's room. I actually don't think, I don't like it when I find Advil in my kid's room. It belongs in a central area, and if they have a bad headache or they're having terrible period cramps, just let me know. I just kind of want to make sure that you're not going to overdose on Tylenol. Tylenol overdose is one of the leading causes of liver failure in young people, young women. Because they're like, I have period cramps, let me take more. Before you know it, they're at 10,000 milligrams a day, right? That's really bad for your liver. So I actually think most 
of our students shouldn't be managing their own meds. They really don't. And, you know, every now and then, I will find like a bottle of Benadryl in my kid's room. And I'm like, done, I'm gone. You know, there's no Benadryl that's being kept in your room. You're having trouble sleeping. Let's work on your sleep hygiene. How's that for you? Um, so other things that you don't want to find in your kid's room, and when I say that, it means you have to actually look in your kid's room. And I do this, right? I don't clean my kid's room. I don't do their laundry. I don't make their beds. Um, but I walk through my kid's room every couple of weeks, and I look for things that cause me concern. If I found razor blades in my kid's room, and I did at one point find um, knives in one of my kid's rooms, and, you know, whatever, it made some sense, but it made me uncomfortable, quite honestly, so I removed them. But a razor blade, really? Your kids are like, you know, they're scraping the windows? I don't think so. They should never be razor blades in your kid's room. Um, uh, foil. Any foil with burnt marks. Is there any natural reason to have foil with burnt marks? Can anybody come up and know? There is no reason. You find foil with burnt marks, every red flag in your head, every alarm should absolutely be going off. A bed spoon. Why is there a bed spoon? No bed spoons. I don't want any silverware in my kids' rooms. Like, these are sort of my reaction as a person who takes care of people and parents who've gone through all of this is I think I don't want to, I, I want to know in the first six months my kid is using heroin. I don't want to find that four years later. I want to know sooner than that so I can help them earlier. Um, Filters. So the common thing that people use for filters, and in that middle slide, the Q-tips and those other things on the right are sort of either caps or, but sometimes cigarette filters look like that. P parents will say to me, if we went through bags and bags of cotton balls or Q-tips, and again, last time anybody bought cotton balls in this room? I don't buy very often, you know, like five years maybe before I bought a bag. But if your kids are saying we're out of cotton balls again, we're out of cotton balls again, and you're buying a new bag every couple weeks, there's a concern for you, okay? But parents will tell me that later. Like, I just didn't know. Bottles of bleach or vinegar helps clean the equipment. Again, I know my kids are not cleaning their windows or their rooms. I should never see that stuff in their room. So this is just, just to inform you as parents out there. Um, if you have somebody in your life that you're worried about, you should have Narcan available to you. I carry it in my purse. I have it on me all the time. Um, it could be a niece or a nephew or a sister-in-law. It could be somebody in your life who actually is on high-dose opiates for pain, but they often seem like they're nodding off. They're concerning to you. They drink with their pain medicine. They need to have Narcan. But really, when you're overdosing from an opiate, you can't self-administer. So they need to have somebody in their house who has this stuff. There's two great websites. This is one of them, Get Naloxone Now. It has videos, how to recognize who somebody is overdosing, how to assemble the kit, how to administer the drug. What if I gave Narcan to everybody in this room? Would I cause any harm? No, unless you were on chronic opiates for some reason, like pain, then you'd feel terrible. But um, hopefully you would let me know that before I did it. What if you were having a seizure right now and I gave you Narcan? Would I hurt you? Would I help your seizure? Nope. What if you're overdosing from benzodiazepines like Valium or Xanax? Would I hurt you? No. Would I help you? No. It fixes one problem. Opiates. Okay? But having said that, it is the only fix for an overdose from opiates. You can sit there and rescue breathe and call 911 and do whatever it is you're going to do, but you're not going to get them breathing again until you administer Narcan. So it is available without a prescription in every Walgreens in the state. It is available more and more at CVS's, although CVS hasn't been doing it as long. They're not as good at what they do as Walgreens. So it's paid for by your insurance. Mass Health is three bucks. Um, my Blue Cross, it was 10 bucks. So if you have somebody you love that you're worried about, if you're a public health person, if you're the person in the room that's the uniform law enforcement back there, there's a crisis in there and people are gonna look at those guys. You guys carry out your patrol cars? Thank you, and that's actually thanks to, thanks to District Attorney Sullivan over here. His office basically bought Narcan for every emergency medical worker in his district, right? Which is extraordinary, because that is way ahead of the game. And these guys on the ground rescue more people. And if you're dead, you're never going to get into recovery. And if we can keep you alive long enough that you really want to get recovery, we think you can get better. I'm almost done. Like, one more slide, I think. If we can get this to work. Okay, so these are the books, and that Dreamland is down there because I like that book. So these are books I read, they sit by my bedside table, I return to them. If you think this stuff is interesting, if you want to learn more, again, you can sign up, take all these slides, you can take a snapshot with your smartphone right now. But um, in the realm of Hungry Ghosts is a book on overall addiction. Chasing the Scream is about failed drug policy in, in the Western world. I have to say that incarcerating people for the disease of addiction doesn't make them any better. 
I said we'd talk about it, but here I have a dopamine level of 45. What is it gonna to take to make that person better? What helps with addiction is time and recovery. That is really the only thing that works. The further you can get away from your use, the longer the time you go, the more likely you are to truly heal and get better. You will be an alcoholic or somebody who's had a, an opiate use disorder all the time. You could relapse, but the rates of relapse go down to 14% if you've been sober for three years, which means 86% of the time you do great. But if you've only been sober for nine months, your relapse rate is enormous. So it's about time and distance from the drug. And what builds dopamine in the brain? Human connections, having friends, restoring relationships with your family and your children, having meaningful work, exercising a lot, giving back to society, having a pet, um, going back to school, things that have to do with regaining your life again builds dopamine. And being locked up in a cell does none of those things. Because you know who those people are? They're your kids and they're your next door neighbors and they're gonna get out someday. And they're not gonna be any better than they were when they walked in. And I know this because I'm a doctor at the jail, right? I know what they look like coming in, I know what they look like coming out, and a lot of them are not much better. So my point there being that if I am trying to help people who really are struggling with this disease, I need to create a spot where they can be for 15 months and I need to get them tons of positive things coming their way, right? That's what's gonna work for our sickest people. There's lots of things that help treat addiction, but I tell you, for my young people who are really struggling, I need long-term sober living with lots of structure. A five-day detox does nothing. All it does is remove the drug from the brain, so you step out on day six and you can overdose and die. It does nothing to promote recovery. And the fact that the state, really, that's all we do is we continue to fund these detox units, it's really, it's a shame. And again, we're the great state of Massachusetts. We should be leading the way in our country's treatment.